Well, first of all, good morning and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm Mike Frank. Uh, for the American founders, uh, primary and central job of the federal government, indeed, some would argue the primary and central job is to provide uh, for the common defense. The surest means of avoiding war, one founder wrote, is to be prepared for it in peace. Translation, supporting freedom and defending the nation would require public spending on the nation's defense even in peacetime. Washington describes spending on our national security as, quote, one of the most powerful instruments of our rising prosperity, and cautioned, quote, if we desire to secure peace, it must be known that we are at all times ready for war. The founders also saw the connection between adequately providing for our national security and our ability to engage in commercial transactions with private parties the world over. When our military fulfills its missions, the sea lanes, cyberspace, and the satellites that circle the globe are free and clear of interference, uh, uncertainty abates, and commerce can proceed on its own merits. A strong national defense and free international trade, in other words, go hand in hand. This is what conservative intellectuals might describe as fusionism. So today we are delighted to have with us Senator and medical doctor Rand Paul to address this very important topic, restoring the founders' vision in foreign policy. A couple of words about our speaker, and then we'll proceed to the program. Dr. Rand Paul is a junior U.S. Senator from Kentucky, first elected in 2010. He's been an outspoken champion for constitutional liberties and fiscal, fiscal responsibility. In fact, one of his first legislative proposals was a very modest proposal to reduce federal spending by half a trillion dollars a year and balance the budget in just five years. He has since introduced similar bills with growing support. Among his committee assignments that's relevant today is his service on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. A graduate of Duke University School of Medicine, uh, Senator Paul was a practicing ophthalmologist in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky for 17 years. Uh, as an aside, one of the uh, guiding principles to which all conservatives subscribe is the notion that a vibrant civil society comprised of charities, churches, and uh, civil local community associations uh, actively engaged in solving social problems is an essential element of a successfully functioning free society. And to that extent, Dr. Paul's own life story exemplifies that principle. In 1995, he founded the Southern Kentucky Lions Eye Clinic, an organization that provides eye exams and surgery to needy families and individuals. Today, even as a U.S. Senator, Dr. Paul continues to provide pro bono eye surgery to Kentuckians in need of care. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Senator Rand Paul. Thank you. I want to thank Heritage for allowing me to speak today. When people have been asking me, where's Jim DeMint, I say, kind of joking, I say, he's gone to a better place. <laughs> But I think that's true. Think tanks are very important, and we're very proud of Heritage, and I want to thank Ed Fulner for all his years and for really establishing a great think tank. I got the idea for this speech when I read a biography of George Kennan last year uh, by John Gaddis, and most of the facts that will be in the speech that will be about Kennan will be from that book. The topic of the speech today is containment and radical Islam. Foreign policy is uniquely an arena where we should base decisions on the landscape of the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. I see the world as it is. I'm a realist, not a neoconservative, nor an isolationist. When candidate John McCain argued in 2007 that we should remain in Iraq for 100 years, I blanched, and I wondered what the unintended consequences of prolonged occupation would be. But McCain's call for a 100-year occupation does capture some truth, that the West is in for a long, irregular confrontation, not with terrorism, which is simply a tactic, but with radical Islam. As many are quick to note, the war is not with Islam. The problem is that a radical element of Islam, the problem is that this radical Islam is no small minority but a vibrant, often mainstream, vocal and numerous minority. In Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and even Afghanistan, where we presided over a constitution written by moderates, radical concepts such as the death penalty for blasphemy or apostasy are the law of the land. A survey in Britain after the subway bombing showed that 20% of the Muslim population in Britain 
approved of the violence. Now, some libertarians argue that Western occupation and intervention fans the flames of radical Islam. I agree. But I don't agree that absent Western occupation, that radical Islam goes quietly into that good night. I don't agree with FDR's Vice President Henry Wallace that the Soviets, or radical Islam in today's case, can be discouraged by the glad hand and the winning smile. Americans need to understand that Islam has a long and perseverant memory. As Bernard Lewis writes, the general level of historical knowledge in American society is abysmally low. The Muslim peoples, like everyone else in the world, are shaped by their history. But unlike some others, they are keenly aware of it. Radical Islam is no fleeting fad, but rather a relentless force. Though at times stateless, radical Islam is also supported by radicalized nations such as Iran. Though often militarily weak, radical Islam makes up for this lack of conventional armies with unlimited zeal. For Americans to grasp the mindset of radical Islam, we need to understand that they're still hopping mad about a massacre at Karbala some 1,300 years ago. Meanwhile, many Americans are often more concerned with who's winning Dancing with the Stars. Over 50% of Americans still believe Iraq attacked us on 9-11. Until we understand the world around us, until we understand at least a modicum of what animates our enemies, we cannot defend ourselves and we cannot contain our enemies. To understand how we will contain radical Islam, we need to understand the longest, most dangerous war in our history, the Cold War. In February 1946, George Kennan sent a 5,000-word telegram heard around the world. The long telegram gained him instant and near-universal fame as it called for containment of the Soviet Union. Today I'm less ambitious, conscious that we live in a world that is lucky to read a 140-character text, much less an essay of 5,000 words. I think all of us, though, have the duty to ask where are the Kennans of our generation? When foreign policy has become so monolithic so lacking in debate that Republicans and Democrats routinely pass foreign policy statements without debate and without votes. Where are the calls for moderation, the calls for restraint? Anyone who questions the bipartisan consensus is immediately castigated, rebuked, and their patriotism challenged. One of the most pressing questions of the day, the possibility of Iran developing nuclear weapons, appears to have less debate in this country than it receives in Israel. In Israel, the current head of the Mossad, Tamir Pardo, states that we need to quit discussing Iran and nuclear weapons as an existential threat to Israel, as that confines us to, as to only one possible cataclysmic response. The former head of the Mossad, Meir Dagan, a war hero, also cautions of the unintended consequences of preemptive bombing of Iran, both the possibility that the strikes are ineffective and that Israel suffers a significant conventional missile response from Iran. Dagan said he did not advocate a preemptive strike against Iran's nuclear program anytime soon. Yuval Diskin, the former chief of Shin Bet, Israel's domestic security service, recently said that an attack against Iran might cause it to speed up its nuclear weapons. Iran's army's chief of staff suggested in an interview with the Israeli paper Haaretz that the Iranian nuclear threat was not quite as imminent as some have portrayed it. On the other side of the coin, Prime Minister Netanyahu does warn that Iran is on the verge of obtaining nuclear weapons. There is a real debate in Israel over what to do. These are not easy questions. It seems that the debate of Iran is more robust in Israel than it is here. I have voted for sanctions against Iran in the hope of preventing war and allowing for diplomacy. The sanctions have not been fully implemented, but they do appear to have brought Iran back to the negotiating table. I did, however, hold up further sanctions until Senator Reid added my amendment that states, nothing in this bill is to be interpreted as a declaration of war or as a use of authorization of force. The debate over war is the single most important debate that occurs in this country, and it should not be glossed over. I am persuaded, though, that the sanctions, for the sanctions to change Iran's behavior, we must have the commitment of Iran's major trading partners. China, Russia, Japan, India. Understandably, no one wants to imagine what happens if Iran develops nuclear weapons. But if we don't have at least some of that discussion now, the danger exists that war is the only remedy. No one, myself included, wants to see a nuclear Iran. 
Iran does not need to know that does need to know that all the options are on the table. But we should not preemptively announce that diplomacy or containment will never be an option. In a recent Senate resolution, the bipartisan consensus stated that we will never contain Iran should they get a nuclear weapon. In the debate, I made the point that while I think it unwise to declare that we will contain a nuclear Iran, we shouldn't announce that, I think it's equally unwise to say we will never contain a nuclear, uh, nuclear Iran. War should never be the only option. Let me be clear, I don't, I don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, but I also don't want to decide with certainty that war is the only option. Containment, though, should be discussed as an option with regard to a larger threat, the more generalized threat with radical Islam. Radical Islam, like communism, is an ideology with far reach and will require a firm and patient opposition. In George Kennan's biography, John Gaddis describes a meeting with Strobe Talbot, Kennan and President Clinton. Clinton asks, why don't we have a concept as succinct as containment? Kennan's response, that containment had become a misleading simplification. Strategy could not be made to fit on a bumper sticker. The president laughed and said, that's why you're a great diplomat and, and scholar and not a politician. Kennan chafed that his opponent sometimes drew conclusions from containment that were disagreeable to him, but the fact of the matter is that the concept of containment succinctly describes an active strategy, or as Gaddis put it in his book, a path between the appeasement that had failed to stop World War II and the alternative of a Third World War. What the United States needs is a foreign policy that finds that middle path, a policy that is not rash or reckless, a foreign policy that is reluctant, restrained by constitutional checks and balances, but does not appease. A foreign policy that recognizes the danger of radical Islam, but also the inherent weakness of radical Islam. A foreign policy that recognizes the danger of bombing countries on the pretext of what they might someday do. A foreign policy that requires, as Kennan put it, a long-term patient but firm and vigilant containment of expansive tendencies a policy that understands the distinction between vital and peripheral interests. No one believes that Kennan was an isolationist, but Kennan did advise that non-interference in the internal affairs of another country was, after all, a long-standing principle of American diplomacy that should be accepted only when the means to conduct such interventions successfully and can afford the cost. In Kennan's famous X article, he argues that containment meant the application of counterforce at a series of constantly shifting geographical and political points, corresponding to the shifts and maneuvers of Soviet policy. <coughs> he later clarified, though, that he did not necessarily mean that the application of counterforce had to always mean a military response. He argued that containment was not a strategy to counter entirely by military means, but containment was not diplomacy alone either. Like communism, radical Islam is an ideology with worldwide reach. Containing radical Islam requires a worldwide strategy like containment. It requires counterforce at a series of constantly shifting worldwide points. But counterforce does not necessarily mean large-scale wars with hundreds of thousands of troops, nor does it always mean a military action at all. Kennan objected to Truman's doctrine that implied an obligation to act wherever Soviet aggression or intimidation occurred without regard to whether American interests were at stake or the means existed with which to defend them. He was concerned that the Truman Doctrine was a blank check to give economic and military aid to any area in the world. Likewise, today's Truman's caucus wants boots on the ground, weapons in the hands of freedom fighters everywhere, including the Syrian rebels. <coughs> Perhaps we might want to ask the opinion of the one million Christians who live in Syria, many of whom fled Iraq after our Shiite allies were installed. Perhaps we might want to ask, will the Syrian rebels respect the rights of Christians, women, and other ethnic minorities? In the 1980s, the War Caucus in Congress armed Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen in their fight against the Soviet Union. In fact, it was the official position of our State Department to support radical jihad against the Soviets. We all know how well that worked out. Out of the Arab Spring, new nations have emerged. While discussion of Iran dominates foreign affairs, I think more time needs to be allotted to whether we should continue to send aid and weapons to countries that are hostile to Israel and to the United States. 
I, for one, believe it is unwise to send more M1 tanks and F-16 fighters to Egypt. Kennan argued that integrating force with foreign policy did not mean blustering, threatening, waving clubs at people, and telling them if you don't do this or that, we're going to drop a bomb on you. But it did mean maintaining a preponderance of strength. Kennan wrote, the strength of the Kremlin lies in the fact that it knows how to wait, but the strength of the Russian people lies in the fact that they know how to wait longer. Radical Islam's only real strength is just such an endless patience. They know we will eventually leave. They simply wait for us to leave. We cannot afford endless occupation, but this does not mean that by leaving we disengage or that we cannot and will not contain radical Islam. Everybody now loves Ronald Reagan. Even President Obama wants to vainly compare himself to Reagan. Reagan's foreign policy was robust, but also restrained. He pulled no punches in telling Mr. Gorbachev to tear down that wall. He did not shy away from labeling the Soviet Union as an evil empire, but he also sat down with Gorbachev and negotiated meaningful reductions in nuclear weapons. Many of today's cons neoconservatives, they want to wrap themselves up in Reagan's mantle, but the truth is that Reagan used clear messages of communism's evil and clear exposition of America's strength to contain and ultimately to transcend the Soviet Union. The Cold War ended, and we won, because the engine of capitalism defeated the engine of socialism. Reagan aided and abetted this not by liberation of captive people, but by a combination of don't mess with us, language and diplomacy, not inconsistent with Kennan's approach. Jack Matlock, one of Reagan's national security advisors, wrote, Reagan's Soviet policy had more in common with Kennan's thinking than the policy of any of Reagan's predecessors. Reagan himself wrote, I have a foreign policy. I just don't think it's wise to tell the world what your foreign policy is. Now, his liberal critics would decry a lack of sophistication, but others would understand that there is an advantage to having no stated policy in having a policy of strategic ambiguity. If you enumerate your policy, if you telegraph to the Soviets that the strategic defense initiative is a ploy to get them to come to the bargaining table, that the ploy what happens to your ploy? The ploy is then made impotent. Strategic ambiguity is still a value. The world knows we possess a virtually unparalleled nuclear and conventional arsenal. Over 60 years of not using our nuclear weapons shows wise restraint. But our enemies need to be uncertain. What provocation may awaken an overwhelming response? Is an un it is an uncertainty that still helps to keep the peace. I recognize that foreign policy is complicated. It's inherently less black and white than most people you know, see domestic policy. I think there is a room, though, for a foreign policy that strikes a balance. If, for example, we imagine a foreign policy that is everything to everyone, that is everywhere all the time, that would be one polar extreme. Likewise, if we imagine a foreign policy that is nowhere any of the time, that's another extreme that there's a challenge and there are dangers to our security that really do exist in this world. So I think really there has to be some in-between, some balance. There are times, such as existed in Afghanistan with bin Laden terrorist camps, that do require intervention. Maybe we should strike a balance. Maybe we should be somewhere some of the time. Maybe we should be somewhere some of the time and do so with respecting our Constitution and the legal powers of Congress and the presidency. Reagan's foreign policy was much closer to what I'm advocating than what we have today. The former chairman of the American Conservative Union and current NRA president, David Keene, noted that Reagan resorted to military force far less than many of those who came before him or after him. As Keene points out, Reagan's policy was much less interventionist than the presidents of both parties who came before and after him. I would argue that a more restrained foreign policy is the true conservative foreign policy, as it includes two basic tenets of true conservatism respect for the Constitution, and fiscal discipline. I'm convinced that we need, what we need is a foreign policy that works within these two constraints, a foreign policy that works within the confines of the Constitution and the realities of our fiscal crisis. Today in Congress, there is no such nuance, no such moderation of dollars or of executive power. Last year, I introduced a non-binding resolution in the Senate, reiterating the President's words when he ran for office, that no President should go to war unilaterally without the approval of Congress, unless an imminent threat to our national security exists. Not one Democrat voted to support candidate Obama's words, and only 10 Republicans did.
some well-meaning senators came up to me afterwards and said, well, Congress has the power. Congress has the power of the purse strings and can simply cut off funds. The problem is, is that at the beginning of a war, there is sometimes a will to avoid war. But there's rarely, if ever, is there a resolve to cut off funding once troops are in the field. No historic example exists of Congress cutting off funding when troops are in the field. Even during Vietnam, arguably our most unpopular war, funds were never voted down. Madison wrote that the Constitution supposes what history demonstrates, that the executive branch is most prone to go to war and most interested in it, and therefore the Constitution has, with studied care, vested that power in the legislature. We've forgotten this. Since the Korean War, Congress has ignored its responsibility to restrain the president. Congress has abdicated its role in declaring war. What a foreign policy would look like that tries to strike a balance, first it would have less soldiers stationed overseas and less bases. Instead of large, limitless land wars in multiple theaters, we would, when necessary, target our enemy and strike with lethal force. We would not presume that we build nations, nor would we presume that we have the resources to build nations. Many of the countries formed after World War I are collections of tribal regions that have never been governed by a central government and may in fact be ungovernable. When we must intervene with force, we should attempt to intervene in cooperation with the host government. Interve intervention against the will of the host government is war, such as Afghanistan or Libya, and it should require a declaration of war by Congress. Such constitutional obstacles purposely make it more difficult to go to war. This was the founders' intention, to make war less likely. We did not declare war or authorize force to begin the war in Libya. This is a dangerous precedent. In our foreign policy, Congress has become not even a rubber stamp, but an irrelevancy. With Libya, the president sought permission from the UN, from NATO, from the Arab League, from everyone but the US Congress. It's an insult. And how did Congress react? Congress just simply let him get away with it. The looming debt crisis will force us to reassess our role in the world. Admiral Mullen calls the debt the greatest threat to our national security. Former Defense Secretary Robert Gates noted, at some point, fiscal insolvency at home translates into strategic insolvency abroad. Gates added that addressing our financial crisis will require both re-examining missions and capabilities, and perhaps most importantly, will entail going places that have been avoided by politicians in the past. It's time for all Americans, and especially conservatives, to become as critical and reflective when examining foreign policy as we are when examining domestic policy. Should our military be defending this nation or constantly building other nations? What constitutes our actual national defense? And what parts of our foreign policy are more like an irrational offense? It's the soldier's job to do his duty. But it's the citizen's job to question their government, particularly when it comes to putting soldiers in harm's way. And of course, the questions are, that are forced to ask today is, can we afford this? I hope such questions begin to be asked and we see some sort of return to a constitutional foreign policy. I hope this occurs before the debt crisis occurs and not amidst a crisis. To that end, I will fight to have a voice for those who wish to see a saner, more balanced approach to foreign policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are adjourned.